when I was teaching at the University of Nairobi for a number of years, um, and uh, looking at the, uh, at the relationships between tribes and so forth within the African experience, I was impressed that there are very powerful peacemaking themes uh, that seemed evident in the African experience of, re of attempting to develop uh, communities in which that really did function in this way. I am because we are, and we are because I am. So I asked my students in the classes I was teaching, do research and go and ask your great grandparents and grandparents, how did they make the peace when um, there was conflict? How did they work at that? Before the Christian faith was even known in your communities, how did they do that? And so I received research papers from all the tribes of Kenya, I think, um, describing how they made the peace. And so I want to just describe uh, one tribe right now as it worked at peacemaking, as an example of how they, how they worked at peacemaking in times of conflict. Of course, all the peacemaking related to a need to keep the hierarchy functioning in harmony. And so that meant that the person lower in the hierarchy needed to show respect to the person above in the hierarchy. Um, so that that's the way life force flowed from the chief at the top down through the hierarchy to those below. So those below would function respectfully toward the one above. But suppose it broke down. Suppose it's not working very well. Um, I'll tell about one tribe called the Zamburu, the Zamburu tribe, how they brought it, how they worked at it. Oh, this would, although this sort of approach basically would apply to all the tribes of East Africa. But the Zamburu, suppose the young men have had a conflict, maybe over a girl. And um, it became a violent conflict where the young men divided and uh, someone even might have got killed. So the wise elders, high in the hierarchy, the chief and his council of elders would meet. And then they would call into the meeting these young warriors to hear what had happened. And so they would listen very carefully to the source of the conflict, what had happened, the circumstances under which a warrior had been killed. They would listen very carefully to, to all of that, the wise old men of the tribe. And then they would pass judgment as to what needs to be done to change the situation into a peaceful situation, how to restore the peace. And so they would probably decide that the young man who had committed the war, the, who had committed, who had, who had been involved in the killing, would need to pay maybe 20 cows to the family of the one whom he had killed, something like that. What needs to be done for restoration? The wise men would decide what steps needed to be taken in order for restoration to take place. So they would pass judgment. And then these wise elders would hold in their hands, in one hand, a uh, sprig of dry wood, dry branches, and in the other hand, the chief would hold in his hand a sprig of green bushes, of green twigs. And so each warrior who had been involved in the conflict would come forward and take a twig. If he took a green twig, that meant he agreed with the judgment of the wise people. If he took a dry twig, tw a twig that meant that he disagreed with the decision of the elders. So if a young man or several young men took a dry twig, then the elders would sit again <laughs> to work through the process again, hoping to find a resolution to the conflict that all the warriors would take a green twig. 
So once the warriors had all taken a green twig, they now knew that the warriors agreed with the wisdom and the judgment of the wise old men as to what had to be done. Now they're ready for the covenant of peace. Just declaring peace was not enough. They now needed to make a covenant of peace. So they would take a white bull, one year old, a healthy bull, the best they could offer, and they would slay the bull. And catch the blood in a uh, bucket. Then they would make a gate of peace. These lines are supposed to represent weapons. So they would stack their weapons like this, making a long gate of peace. So then all the warriors who had been involved in the conflict would stoop down and they would walk through this hallway of transitioning from conflict to peace. They would walk through that hallway beneath these weapons that were standing side by side, interlocking with one another, but providing a small pathway, passageway, through which you would move from being in conflict now to being in peace. And while you did that, the elders would take this bowl of blood from the bowl and with a, a branch of a tree would dip those leaves into that blood and sprinkle the warriors and sprinkle the uh, weapons with this blood from the sacrificial bowl. And this blood would go down into the ground, which is where the ancestors have been buried. They're buried in the ground. And so the blood would not only be sprinkled on the elders, on, on the warriors, but that blood would go into the ground, touching the ancestors who are buried within the ground. So this covenant of peace, this blood of the covenant of peace, united the warriors now in a covenant of peace, with the ancestors also in the covenant of peace. They would now have formed this covenant of peace. Now the witness to the covenant of peace, they would take the white skin of the bull, cut it in strips, that white skin, and then they would bind those strips of white skin around the, uh, the wrists of the, of the warriors who had been fighting with each other. So each warrior now had this covenant of peace, a white cow skin bracelet on his arm. And when that happened, the warriors who had this covenant of peace on their arms could never again fight with each other. They had to refrain from any violence towards one another, for they had been united through the blood of that bull with the ancestors in the covenant of peace and with one another in the covenant of peace, and the witness to it all is that white bracelet of the skin of the bull around the warrior's arms. And then they would take a step further. They would take that bull and cook it and have a great feast. And the warriors who had been fighting with each other would take a piece of that meat and go and give it to a warrior that he had been fighting with. And so the warriors are feeding each other from this peace covenant <laughs> uh, bull that had been slain. So they're having a grand feast together, feeding each other, which now solidifies the covenant in a celebration of eating and uh, enjoying each other's presence. That's how they would work at the peace. Now, it wasn't always totally effective, but it was also remarkably effective. It was an attempt to build a relationship when there was a broken relationship. The most serious broken relationship, however, was not between warriors. It was between father and son. 
if there was a broken relation, if there was a broken relationship between a father and his son, the elders of the tribe would always intervene. They would meet with the father, and then they would meet with the son, probably first of all meeting separately to hear the situation, what has gone on, why the broken relationship. Why was the tribe so concerned about right relationships between father and son? It's because of the hierarchy, that power and life flows from the top down. God is at the top. But the father's also up in the hierarchy, isn't he? And so peace and goodwill and, and uh, life flows from the top down. If there is a broken relationship between the son who is down here in the hierarchy and his father who's up here in the hierarchy, if there's a broken relationship, that means that instead of life-giving power flowing from the top down, you have conflict flowing from the top down. And if there's conflict from the top down, then life will not flow. And there will be a destructive spirit within the tribe and within the family. So the, the, the elders of the tribe took this very seriously if there was a broken relationship between a father and a son. And they would meet with them and talk with them, try to hear what had happened, pass counsel on what to do to bring about a restoration and a restitution. And when restoration and restitution had been completed, what would they do? Again, they would kill a goat or a chicken and they would have a feast. And the blood of the slain goat or the slain chicken, again, would go into the ground, uniting the ancestral spirits now with this father and son who are committed to a restored relationship. Have you benefited from our teaching ministry? Have you found TVS videos helpful and relevant? Please consider supporting us with your prayers and financial gifts. For more information, visit tvsseminary.com. I've written a book about this called Justice, Reconciliation, and Peace in Africa. I've written a number of books. This one I think is my favorite one. I was looking at it again this morning and I, I, I was just very impressed again with the many ways in which African societies work together to try to work at peacemaking. And sometimes it falls apart. Like in Southern Sudan right now, it's not going well at all. And in that situation, it will need to be the church in a very special way that will need to step forward and help to find bridges because it's the conflict between different hierarchies there in the South. That's what's going on. And the church is the one community that brings together people from different hierarchies, from different tribal systems. It's a new community. So the church, as I say, has a very special responsibility there in that situation. But um, now looking at this book again this morning, I was just very impressed with these various peace themes and how that when the gospel, the Christian gospel comes into the culture, ah, they say, look at this, Jesus, is the Lamb of God who died that we might be restored, that our relationships might be restored. And the communion bread and the communion cup is the communion of the Lamb of God, you know, who received our hostility and our anger and who forgave. We used to kill a bull to bring about restoration of relationship. The bull was innocent of the conflict but we would kill that bull who would receive upon himself our anger and our hostility. And so Jesus is like that bull who receives the anger and hostility of the world upon himself and forgives and invites restoration and reconciliation. And so the communion table is a celebration of the sacrifice of Christ on the cross. And you find that in the African experience, that as the gospel comes into the culture, um, that, that uh, Jesus is seen as the fulfillment of these sacrifices that have taken place uh, for many, many centuries in the African experience, particularly, as I said, expressed in the communion table. So very, very often when there's conflict, 
you will find in the African experience that it's the church nowadays that steps forward. Um, it used to be the elders, the tribal elders. Now it's often the leaders of the church step forward to attempt to work with the protagonist in bringing about peace, centered in what Christ did in absorbing the violence um, on the cross and forgiving. You're aware of the South African experience where there was a tremendous split in that society between the white people and the black people. And it was a, an extremely dangerous situation. It was a situation which was getting worse and worse as the years went on. And uh, finally, it was evident to all concerned, both black and white, that steps must be taken to reconciliation between the whites and the blacks. And um, a team of Christians from Kenya, black and whites together, went to South Africa and they would go to government offices and the offices of political leaders and they would say to them, uh, we are concerned for you. May we meet with you and pray with you that God will give you wisdom on how to work at the situation, uh, this explosive situation of black-white tensions in South Africa. And so these leaders would say, yes, we would appreciate prayer. And so they would have prayer together with these political leaders. And then they would say, look, we'd like to take you all out to the game parks um, where the wild animals are to enjoy the wildlife together. And we'll talk more about steps that could be taken to bring about reconciliation in Africa, in South Africa. And so these black political leaders and white political leaders would agree to, take, to go to a game park together. They would put them in a DC-3 airplane and fly them up to the game park, uh, uh, one of the game parks. And they would spend all day uh, after their arrival traveling together in a vehicle, enjoying the wildlife, the uh, elephants and the rhino and the buffalo and the, and the lion and so forth, having a great time looking at this wonderful display of wildlife uh, roaming these, uh, these vast park areas that South Africa has. And then in the evening, they would come together in, uh, around the campfire and they would have a Bible study and prayer together. And then they would say, now tell your stories. And so the blacks would tell their story of what they have experienced under white racist apartheid. And the blacks and, and the whites would share their experience of what they're afraid of if South Africa becomes a country where whites and blacks have equal rights and equal position in the society, what the whites are afraid of. And so they would share their stories, and then they would dream of what a new South Africa might look at. And they would talk about steps that could be taken to bring about a new South Africa. Around the, around the campfire in the evening, they would talk like that. And then the next day, they would fly back to their responsibilities in, in uh, the offices and so forth, in Johannesburg or Durban, wherever they came from. And, but they, having, been, having listened to each other, and uh, his white police officer might say to his wife, you know, I learned from the blacks that, uh, that when they were in prison, uh, the whites would, would, would make them dig a hole, and then they would stand in that hole, and then the, the white prison guards would urinate on their heads. You know, if I had been treated that way, I would have, uh, I would have, uh, become a communist also, like some of those blacks had become communists, you know. So they would share the horrible stories of what had happened when they were in prison and so forth with each other. And that was transformational. They had to transform their spirits. And they began to find a way to work together at building peace between these two communities, the white and the black. And the amazing, astonishing transformation that has taken place in that society, it's just simply amazing, you know where today South Africa is an interracial society um, with the political leadership being interracial political leadership, a country committed to trying to work harmoniously white and black together through this transition. Um, and at the center of all of that was, was Christ, the Lamb of God, who absorbs the violence and who forgives and in his forgiveness brings authentic reconciliation between the opposing uh, uh, parties, when the church is true to its calling, as in this case, um, 
it, uh, it, it, it was a very uh, fruitful and helpful ministry of reconciliation that the church expressed in South Africa. Now we all know that the church in South Africa also sometimes was a contributor to tension and to broken relationships. But what I'm sharing is an example of the church stepping forward and working at reconciliation in ways that were very positive and very helpful.